Well, let's get right to it. Finally, some interesting stuff. We've got mitosis and meiosis behind us. And so we're going to launch into Chapter 3 from your textbook. We're actually going to split this into two different and distinct lectures, both of which you're responsible for watching this week. This is Part 1 of Chapter 3. In your textbook, this material will refer to pages 43 to 51. Today we're going to start off with a very brief history of Gregor Mendel, again the Austrian monk who's responsible for pioneering the early work in genetics. We'll rehash some of the genetic terminology we've already talked about and introduce some new topics, but much more importantly, we will begin going over the true uh, essence, the true material, the background principles of genetic inheritance. We call that monohybrid crosses. Monohybrid crosses really just mean genetics when you consider one gene or one trait. Uh, we'll do dihybrid crosses in the next class, and obviously that's where we look at two different traits simultaneously. So today we'll only be looking at one gene at a time. And then we will end this lecture where we see that we can use genetics to not only predict offspring appearance when we know something about the parents, but also uh, give us information about parental genotype by looking at the offspring. So you'll see that at the very end. So let's start off talking a little bit about red hair. Uh, red hair is quite unique, it's quite rare, and actually it's so rare that like all rare traits, there are plenty of people who go to great lengths and often fail at having red hair. It's quite easy to notice red hair that is not genuine and natural, and compare that to red hair that is. Uh, red hair that is natural is quite striking, it is quite beautiful, and again, it is quite rare. So lots of people want red hair because red hair is different, and it's different because it's rare. It stands out, it's noticeable, it's not common. The question for us as young budding geneticists becomes, why and how is red hair so rare? The text begins the chapter by talking all about how red hair is made by the body. It talks about brown and black pigments called eumelanin, the red and yellow pigments in hair called pheomelanin, more overall melanin makes hair darker, less overall melanin makes hair lighter, more eumelanin makes hair browner, more pheomelanin makes hair redder, etc., etc. So that's all fine and good. It gives us some idea of the physiological mechanism for making red hair, but it doesn't do squat for us. It doesn't answer our question. It doesn't answer the question of a geneticist. The geneticist didn't ask, why is that one person's hair red? The geneticist is trying to understand the inheritance patterns. We're interested in understanding why fewer people in a population express a red hair phenotype. We're interested in the rareness of the trait, and we're most critically interested in what is it about the DNA of those people with red hair that makes their hair red. What is the DNA genetic basis for the trait, not the physiological melanin basis? Well, scientists studying mice, a classic genetis, geneticist model organism, if you remember that, if you want to study uh, more higher order multicellular system things, you use mice. Can't study hair color in yeast for obvious reasons. Can't even do it in worm or fruit fly. So if you're going to study hair color, you've got to use something like a mouse. Scientists using mice for genetic studies found that a single gene called MC1R encoded a protein, that's what genes do, remember genes are the instructions for building proteins, and the protein encoded by this gene allowed mice to have brown or black fur. This protein, when it was active, caused there to be more of that darker eumelanin, which gave that darker hair color, and less of the pheomelanin, which would have given red color when, when that protein was active. Now, consider what might happen when this gene is mutated. What do you think is going to happen, given this little bit of information I've already told you? Well, when the gene is mutated, the protein can't be made. And when the protein can't be made, there will be less eumelanin and more pheomelanin. The protein, when made, makes there more eumelanin. When the protein's not made, you'll have the opposite condition less eumelanin and more pheomelanin. Pheomelanin is responsible for red hair. So you made a lot of red-haired mice. Mice with MC1R mutations can't make eumelanin because they can't make the protein for that. They have more pheomelanin as an example and so they have red hair. 
Later, as the human genome was being uncovered, scientists found that we have a version of MC1R in our genome as well. It's on our chromosome 16. And individuals with mutated MC1R proteins, humans, have red hair. Why? Because those humans also can't make a lot of eumelanin because their proteins are mutated, their proteins are deficient, and so they have more pheomelanin, and so they have red hair. So again, using a model organism like mice gave us more information about our own genetic basis. So that makes sense in terms of what is it in the DNA of those people that gives them red hair. Now we have some idea of the DNA basis for this. There's a gene for a protein. The protein makes you melanin. When the gene is mutated, you don't make the protein. If you don't have the protein, you can't make brown hair. What are you left with? Red hair. Okay, that's fine. But you remember, we were interested in the rarity. Why is red hair rare? And nothing I just told you explains the rarity of red hair. So let's take a few steps back from the genetics and think a little bit more broadly, think in analogy. Let's consider something. Let's consider that the body is a factory. You, you own this factory. It's your factory. It's your body. And the factory makes brown hair color. Okay. In fact, you have two machines, two places on your factory floor for machines that make brown hair color. So there's some redundancy in there. Here's your factory floor, here are your two machines, and both of these machines make brown hair. Can you make brown hair if both of your machines are working? Well, of course, right? Each machine can make brown hair, so two machines makes brown hair. No problem. Can you make brown hair if one of your machines is broken and the other one works? Well, I don't see why not. You just need to make brown hair. Your factory has this redundancy in it. It has two machines to do the job of one. So if one of those machines breaks, the other one can do the job. And so you still make brown hair. What if both machines are broken? Can you make brown hair? No, then you can't. These are the only two machines in your factory that make brown hair. You only need one to work to have brown hair. But if they're both broken, then you don't have brown hair and the hair you're left with is, rare, is red. Now that also gets at the rarity in a kind of indirect, non-mathematical -math way. What is the most likely scenario for your factory? Both machines working, one machine broken, or both machines broken? The most likely scenario, you would think, is that both machines work. Now something goes wrong. What's going to happen if something goes wrong with these machines? Well, one is going to break, but the other one still works. Both of those scenarios gives you brown hair. What do you think is the rarest, most uncommon, <clears throat> freakish occurrence in your factory? Well, I would expect it to be most uncommon that both machines happen to break. You started with two working machines. Machines break from time to time. Sure, that's right. But both machines broken is almost like being struck with lightning twice. Both machines breaking is going to be the most rare occurrence. We've just linked the trait to the rarity. Both machines broken gives you the red hair. Both machines breaking is the rarest occurrence in your factory, and so red hair is most rare. Now that doesn't discuss DNA at all. We've gone quite far from the way that DNA works, but at least we've linked rarity to machines. Believe it or not, all the principles we've just covered in this hopefully relatively simple analogy are the basis of Mendelian genetics. So congratulations. You all now fully understand basic Mendelian genetics. But let's go through the real genetics before we start patting each other on the back. You get two machines for each trait, tying directly into the analogy. We sometimes would call those genes. More appropriately, we should call those alleles. You get one allele from your mother and one allele from your father. We each have two versions two machines, two alleles for every gene in our genome. We talked quite a bit that, uh, about that in the mitosis lecture. If both of your genes are not mutated, if both of the genes, again, alleles that you get from each parent, are wild type, they carry no mutations, then you have two working machines. Neither is broken. And you show the normal trait. If one of those alleles is wild type, and the other is mutated, if one machine works and the other is broken, you still can make brown hair. So you still 
show the normal trait. But to get the abnormal trait, the different trait, the trait like red hair, neither allele can be working. Both alleles are mutant. And then and only then do you show that other trait. So that's why red hair is rare. To recap the whole thing and tie it all together, what gives the red hair is that mutant allele, that mutant gene that was discovered in mice, MC1R. That's what gives red hair. But a person with one normal MC1R gene and one mutant MC1R gene has normal brown hair. A person with two normal unmutated genes has normal brown hair. To get red hair, you have to have inherited a mutant MC1R gene from your mother. You must also have to have inherited a mutant MC1R gene from your father, giving you two broken machines, the least common event. And only then will you have two broken machines in your genome. You'll be unable to make brown hair, and red hair will, will um, result. And so the rarity is due to the fact that both of those alleles must be mutated, and mutant alleles are less common than ones that are uh, normal. So the Austrian monk who gave us all of this insight was Gregor Mendel. He was the first person to methodically study or understand how traits are passed from parents to offspring to study inheritance. Remember, we had no idea what DNA was as a molecule when Mendel was doing this work. Uh, we had just begun to surmise that the genetic information was contained in the nucleus of a living cell. So Mendel did this work quite naive to what was really going on. Mendel did his experiments with what is called controlled crosses. He took parents that looked very, very different, parents that had a known uh, genotype, parents that had a known composition of traits, and he mated those parents. He, he controlled which were the parents of given offsprings, and then he uh, collected the offspring from those matings and observed the appearance of them. So he tracked generational lineage, he tracked inheritance, by controlling who the parents would be, and then measuring and observing the offspring. Now, obviously, you can't do this kind of work with human beings. It's uh, unethical, to say the least. And so Mendel used pea plants as his model organism. Mendel, again, was naive to DNA. We're not. So why should we deprive ourselves of tying this information into what we know about DNA? As I go through this lecture, and the next one as well, I will try to, whenever possible, to tie the concepts that we're discussing with Mendelian genetics into what we already know about meiosis, mitosis, and DNA in general. I think, and I think there's a lot of uh, agreement out there, that the more concepts are linked in your mind, the better you should be able to understand them and recall them. So we're not going to treat material this semester like independent, discrete units of knowledge. Certainly we are not going to try to memorize what's being presented here. We're going to try to understand it, and understand it in a large, kind of cohesive picture. Have all concepts tie into all others as best we can. So, as we go through this lecture, please kind of keep in the back of your mind the things we've already covered. We have, after DNA replication, sister chromatids that are identical and held together, but we don't think of those as two separate alleles or two separate genes. Sister chromatids are exact replicas. Homologous chromosomes are not. You get one member of a homologous chromosome pair from your mother and one from your father. They may contain the same alleles and information, but they don't necessarily have to. Sister chromatids are identical. They're the result of DNA replication. Homologous chromosomes are non-identical. They are the result of sexual reproduction. So what we'll be talking about today when we talk about two genes, two alleles, inheritance, one from mom, one from dad, is not these two alleles that you see here, these two are identical sister chromatids from a DNA replication event. We're talking about these two alleles here. The one that you got from your mother as well as the one that you got from your father. So please always keep that in mind as we go through. So here is Gregor Mendel. Again, an Austrian monk. He had a background in agriculture as well as a background in science. He was born in what is now referred to as the Czech Republic into humble beginnings as part of a farming family. His mother and farmer owned a farm, and that was their livelihood. He was chosen, though, due to his uh, basic intelligence to be university educated. The universities at the time were mostly religious. 
So the university he went to was part of an Augustinian monastery, and he became an Augustinian monk after that education. He always remained through his whole life, like his parents, very interested in agriculture. He never forgot what he learned on the farm when he was growing up. But his university education in science taught him how to approach problems scientifically. It taught him the scientific method, taught him the importance of uh, logical plannings of experiments, and taught him the basics of keeping meticulous notes and applying mathematics to his discoveries. So he kind of came at this well prepared for the studies he was about to embark on. He had the agricultural experience for working with plants, but he had the scientific training from his university education to do good science. For about seven years, from 1856 to 1863, Mendel conducted experiments on the breeding behaviors of pea plants. Even after Mendel's work was published, it wasn't really appreciated for what it was. It wasn't noticed or adopted by the heredity field. There wasn't even genetics at the time. It was 35 years later, after Mendel's death, that his work was rediscovered and independently replicated, and only then was it realized just how important Mendel's contributions were to the understanding of inheritance. Sometimes you can make really good choices in life, sometimes you make not so good choices, but when you make really good choices, I mean really, really good choices, and you make those really good choices even though you have no idea what the hell you're doing or why, that's just called pure luck. And Mendel was extremely lucky in the choices that he made early on in his experiments. It is frighteningly uh, scary to think of what might have come of his experiments had he chosen a different model organism, had he chosen different traits, had he done his science differently. Um, many, if not all, of the decisions he made were just serendipitously lucky to give him the results that he achieved. First lucky decision was his choice of pea plants. It's easy to cultivate. Mendel had a greenhouse at his monastery. He could easily control the growth of these plants. Pea plants go, grow relatively fast, you might remember. That's a key consideration for model organisms, a fast generation time. If you're doing studies of inheritance, you have to look at grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, and if you have a long generation time, you can't collect all of those generations in a single year or a single, um, a single lifetime. Pea plants provide a very large number of offspring, per mating. That gets back to that statistical point we made in our first lecture together. It made it uh, an excellent model organism for statistical analyses, that large n, that large sample size, so that's always good. And there was a great variety of pea plants available to Mendel, which differed from each other in their traits. Uh, difference is in their height, in their seed color, in their seed shape, in their pod shape, etc. And each of these varieties of pea plants were what we would call genetically pure, true breeding or pure breeding. What that really means is that these plants were, were strains, pure breeding strains. What that really means is that every single member of that strain, every single member of that pure breeding plant collection was genetically identical to all the other members of the same strain. I'll, I'll say that again because it's critically important. When you have strains, when you have pure breeding, true breeding strains of anything, yeast, mice, plants, pea plants, what that means is if you were to grow two separate individual plants from two separate individual seeds, but both of the same strain, they will be genetically identical to one another, like identical twins. And that's critically important for genetic studies because it makes the differences easy to spot and measure because there's nothing else which is different in a single strain. Okay? When you're dealing with plants in a single strain, the differences are easy to spot because everything else is genetically identical. Mendel initially chose to study seven different characteristics of pea plants. They're listed here. Seed color, yellow or green. Seed shape, round or wrinkled. The color of the seed coat, gray or white. The color of the seed pod, yellow or green. The pod's shape, is it puffed out, inflated, and smooth, or constricted, where you can see the individual peas uh, shaped through the pod. The position of the flowers, are they along the stem or at the, the, the tip of the stem? And the length of the stem. Is it a tall plant or is it a short plant? Those were the seven traits. 
Another one of Mendel's extremely lucky and wise decisions is that he picked only traits that had two different phenotypes. There are no purple seeds. There are no moderate pod shapes. There are no flowers along the stem and at the tip. These are two phenotypic, uh, two phenotype traits, A or B, trait 1 or trait 2, and that's it. The phenotype could only be one of these two traits and nothing more. And that was critically important uh, because, one, it got to the general mechanism of genetics, which we'll see in just a moment, but more importantly, it was easy to measure. All you had to do was look at the plant and you could see the trait on it. You didn't have to measure with a ruler. Uh, you didn't have to make a judgment call. The seed was either yellow or it was green, period. And there was nothing more to the observation of Mendel's science. Mendel's greatest choice, however, was using his university education and his use of the scientific method. I truly hope that all of you know what the scientific method means at this point as sophomores or beyond in college. Um, if you don't, you can come talk to me. We can review it real quick. You don't need to know it so much for this course to be successful, but you certainly should know it as college students in a natural sciences curriculum. Mendel was methodical. He tested his hypotheses using logic. He used math to get quantitative values for all of his work. He kept meticulous notes. And he could, using all of these skills, see the patterns of genetics. Now last, before we actually go right into the mechanisms of genetics, these monohybrid crosses, I want to be sure that we are all clear and understand the terms that we're about to use for this material. Let's be sure that we're all speaking the same language. When we say a gene, we mean a trait, a genetic factor or a piece or part of DNA that helps determine a physical characteristic. An example of a gene is hair color, or an example of a gene now is seed color. An allele is a version or alternative of that gene. An allele has a specific property for that trait, such as blonde hair or yellow seeds. Mendel didn't know what the term gene was. That, gene, that term hadn't been coined. It was, uh, wasn't used until after Mendel's death. But he still had some idea that there were discrete locations of information that allowed this information to be passed on from generation to generation. Again, a great example of a gene is seed shape. A great example of alleles for that gene are smooth seeds or wrinkled seeds. We now know that genes exist on chromosomes. Chromosomes are really just strings or chains of genes. We also know that we get one chromosome from each parent. Those chromosomes are homologous. Each of those chromosomes has the same gene in the same location, but they not necessarily contain the same allele. So if this is seed shape, then we had the seed shape gene on each of these two parental chromosomes in your genome. However, this allele might code for round seeds, while this allele codes for wrinkled seeds. They could, of course, both be the same, round and round. That depends on what the parent gives to that offspring. A locus is a specific place on a chromosome that is occupied by a gene. So this physical position of this gene on this chromosome is its locus. The plural of locus is loci. So multiple genes have loci on multiple chromosomes. A genotype is an organism's entire set of alleles, its entire set of genes, its complete complement of genetic information. Everything that is DNA based and on chromosomes in a given uh, organism, in a given individual, is its genotype. It is, simply put, the sum total of that organism's entire genetic information. A phenotype is the physical expression of the organism's genotype. It is all of the physical traits that come from that DNA. One example is that my mother, for argument's sake, may have given me the genetic information, the allele, for having hazel eyes. My mom does have hazel eyes. My father has brown eyes. We can assume that my father gave me the allele, an allele for brown eyes. My genotype is what I have in my DNA, one brown allele and one hazel allele. That's the sum total of the genetic information that I have for eye color. However, my phenotype is whatever the physical manifestation of that trait is. In other words, look at my eyes and tell me my eye color. My phenotype is brown eyes. So in this case, my father's DNA, one, and my mother's DNA is hidden somehow. Hmm. That raises a question. Given that my genotype 
for eye color is brown and hazel, I have two different alleles, do you think you would use the term heterozygote or homozygote for me uh, with regards to this gene? Well, a heterozygote is an individual organism that has two different alleles at a single gene. A homozygotic individual is someone who has two of the same allele for a gene. In this eye color example, I have one brown allele from my father and one hazel allele from my mother. So the two alleles in my genome are different. That makes me heterozygotic. Anytime an organism has two different alleles for a single gene, they are called heterozygotic for that gene. This schematic here shows a heterozygotic uh, situation. Here we're looking at seed shape again. This plant has one allele for round seeds and the other allele for wrinkled seeds. That's two different alleles and so this plant is heterozygotic. If my genotype for eye color were hazel hazel, I got a hazel allele from my mother and a hazel allele from my father or brown brown or blue blue, then I would be homozygotic because I would have two identical alleles in each of those chromosome positions. How do you think an organism becomes homozygotic? Well, it's fairly straightforward, I hope. They get the same allele from each parent. Mom gives them an allele, and Dad gives them the very same allele for the very same trait. Let's hit on the last few important points before we move on. Anything can be a phenotype. We kind of use these physical traits pretty often for our simple examples, like hair color and eye color. Sure, those are physical traits. But the predisposition or likelihood for the development of breast cancer is a phenotype. It is a genetically determined trait that has a physical expression, in this case, the development of cancer. We also use the term phenotype for microorganisms. So if we're doing work with yeast, some yeast cells can make their own amino acid tryptophan, and other yeast cells can't. That's a phenotype. You can't look at the yeast cell and see that. You can't tell that trait from its appearance, but you can measure it. It is the physical manifestation of genes and alleles that the yeast cell has, and so it is a phenotype. One of our own cells' ability to repair its DNA is a phenotype. Again, you can't see that by looking at it, but some cells repair their DNA really, really well when it's damaged, and some cells can't. That's a physiological manifestation of a DNA genetic content. So based on the cell's genotype, it either can repair its DNA well or it can't. The genotype are the alleles and genes that the cell has for repairing DNA. The phenotype is the cell's actual ability to repair its DNA. Even psychological issues with genetic predispositions are phenotypes. The susceptibility of someone who has prolonged stress and their predisposition to post-traumatic stress disorder has a genetic component. And so the development of those syndromes are phenotypes. Now, genes only get you so far. Please don't think for a moment that I believe that genes are the do-all and end-all of who we are. I do not. The environment plays a huge role in the phenotype, in the, ex the physical expression, the physical manifestation of an individual. And this is the nature-nurture event. We have lots of information about how genes affect people, but we also have lots of information about how the environment does, and that's not unique to people. You easily could have a plant or a tree that has the alleles to be very, very tall. The alleles, the genetic predeterminants for being the tallest tree in the forest. But if you grow that tree and you block it from receiving sunlight and you give it the smallest amount of water you possibly could while keeping it alive, you will have a short tree. Without the right environment, the right nutrients, the right energy, that tree can't grow to its genetic potential. It can't be tall because it doesn't have the environment in which it can be tall and it will remain short. We have a pretty good understanding of how many things are impacted by the genetics and by the environment.
And there is a broad spectrum across this for individual traits. Something like Down syndrome or a fairly rare syndrome called phenylketonuria where individuals can't metabolize the uh, amino acid phenylalanine. These are strongly genetic. If you have the genes or the chromosomes for these syndromes, you will have these disorders. There's no doubt about that. Um, they are genetically based. Hemophilia is largely genetically based, but there's some environmental component. Ulcers are really 50-50. Ulcers have a genetic predisposition, but then you also typically have to have some infection with specific types of bacteria to get that ulcer. So just the bacteria, an environmental component, won't give you the ulcer. Just the genes won't give you the ulcer, but the, but the genes for the ulcer combined with the bacterial infection together give you the ulcer. Diabetes is a little bit more environmental than it is genetic. And then things like tuberculosis and scurvy, almost purely genetic. Scurvy is purely genetic. It's vitamin D deficiency. And so if you get the vitamin D, you don't have scurvy. If you don't get the vitamin D, you do have scurvy. And it ends with an environmental component. There's no genetic basis at all. And so we have a broad spectrum of the, of the contributions of genetics and environment to these things that we face as human beings. Some traits, like the traits that Mendel chose for his pea plants, again, a lucky and wise decision, are very largely genetic. They're, they're governed by nature. While others, like scurvy and tuberculosis, are quite nurture dependent. They involve uh, the environment. But always remember, especially with people, free will good choices and common sense can do wonders to overcome many, many genetic predispositions. We have large brains, self-reflection, self-awareness, planning. We have lots of cognitive abilities that most other organisms on this planet don't possess. And so in our own genetic lineage, in our own uh, genetic governance, alleles and genotypes passed on in families don't necessarily have to equate to phenotypes. We can change our genetics with uh, the right decisions and the right thought. This is the perfect example. There are many, many genes that play a role in the predisposition to alcoholism. Uh, there's no doubt about that. Genetics plays a large role in an individual's predisposition to becoming an addict to many things, uh, drugs, gambling, etc. But if you never engage in the activity through free will and thought and decision, you will not develop the trait. Someone with a predisposition for addiction who stays away from alcohol and drugs will not manifest that trait, due to nothing more than pure will. All right, so let's get into monohybrid crosses. Don't let the name fool you. These are pretty simple, uh, pretty straightforward to understand. Monohybrid crosses are nothing more than matings, where we, and by we I mean us geneticists, are interested in only one gene, one trait. So we only measure one trait after a mating. Again, Mendel started with his pure breeding strains of pea plants. You remember what that means? That means they are genetically identical. The traits are fully accounted for. Another way to say that, now that we have the terminology, is that these plants are homozygous for the trait that they are expressing. We mean that if the plant is tall, it has two alleles for tall in its genome. That's what homozygous means. If a plant is, it plant is short, it has two short alleles in its genome for being short. Homozygous plants have identical alleles in the two positions on their two parental chromosomes. So there is no heterozygosity. We have no plants that have two different alleles for any gene in this strain. Remember, when we say things like homozygous and heterozygotic, we're talking about genotype, we're talking about DNA composition. And when we say things like for the trait they are expressing, we are talking about the phenotype, we're talking about the physical manifestation of that DNA. So let's first consider the trait of round seeds and wrinkled seeds, seed shape. Round seeds and wrinkled seeds are two versions or two alleles for that trait. And remember, Mendel focused exclusively on traits with only two possibilities. Although pea plants are usually self-fertilizing, Mendel did away with this. He cut the anthers out of some of the plants and the stamen out of others, or whatever the hell you call things that plants mate with. Uh, but essentially, Mendel made it impossible for plants to self-fertilize so he can control the matings. He would transfer pollen manually from one plant to another, controlling the crosses. And so Mendel really could control who was the mommy plant and who was the daddy plant.
The first generation of any genetic cross for a genetic experiment, for a cross such as Mendel's, is called the P generation. The P stands for parental, and the P generation is only the initial mating of a genetic uh, experiment. Mendel crossed plants that came from round seeds with plants that came from wrinkled seeds. And so here are his two treats, traits. Remember, they're pure breeding. So the round seeded plants only have round seed alleles, and the wrinkled seed plants only have wrinkled seed alleles. Mendel controlled that cross. So this is what Mendel did. He crossed seeds, he plants with round seeds with plants with wrinkled seeds. And he waited to see what the seeds of the next generation would look like. The next generation, the offspring of the P generation, is called the F1 generation. Here, F stands for filial, but we won't use that term at all. We'll just call it the F1. And I'll get slightly ahead of myself, but it's important to point out here. Uh, matings among the F1 generation, so the grandkids of the P generation, are called the F2. Matings of the F2s are called the F3s. Mating of the F3s are called the F4s. So from then on in, we just call F and a number to signify the generations. When Mendel looked at all of the F1 seeds, when he looked at the results of the mating of these plants here, he saw that, surprisingly, all of them were round. All of them. All of them. You say, wow, what the hell just happened? Well, what did just happen? What does that mean to you? What do you think happened? One plant had round seeds, dad. One plant had wrinkled seeds, mom. And all the kids look like dad. Exclusively. Not wrinkled in the slightest. So he said, well, maybe the male plant is dominant, right? Pretty typical, stereotypical uh, assumption of someone back in Mendel's day. It's got to be the father. So he switched. Remember, he can control who the parents are. He made the father have the wrinkled seeds and the mother have the round seeds. And what did he find? Same results. Everything was round. So it wasn't the gender. It wasn't the parent. You call that a reciprocal cross when you switch the genotype of the mother and the father. So it was independent of the gender of the parent's plant. Somehow, regardless of who had the trait, round was masking wrinkled. And it wasn't gender dependent. Round was masking wrinkled. So then you ask yourself, well, is the wrinkled trait gone? Did some magical force gobble up the wrinkled trait, leaving only the round? If that's so then wrinkled is gone. Certainly it looks like wrinkled is gone. And if something about this mating made the wrinkled DNA, that allele, that genetic unit for wrinkled seeds, if that's gone, then what should we do to test that idea? Well, we can take these F1 plants that all have round seeds and self-fertilize them. Let them mate with each other, let them mate with themselves, because again it's a plant, let them self-fertilize. It looks to me like round gives round. Take a round plant, made it with a wrinkled plant, you get all round. Now if we're self-fertilizing, we're taking nothing but round plants and mating them. Well, looks like we should get all round. So the plants were allowed to pollinate themselves. You can do this in non-self-fertilizing model organisms, too. You can mate siblings, so brothers and sisters in the F1 generation can be mated. Sounds a little disgusting, but we're talking about doing this with flies and yeast and things like that, so uh, not really a big deal. And again, now that gives rise to an F2 generation, the second generation of this experiment, the grandchildren of the P generation, and what do we find? Holy moly. We find in this case... About three-quarters of those plants have round seeds, but one-quarter of them have wrinkled. The wrinkled came back. Are you kidding me? So wrinkled was there in the grandmother or grandfather. Then wrinkled was gone completely in the parents. And then when the parents mated, wrinkled came back. So wrinkled wasn't gobbled up. Wrinkled didn't disappear. It wasn't gone after all. It appears as though... The wrinkled phenotype was just kind of hiding. Again, it was masked. It was completely masked. It was completely overtaken by the round phenotype. The round phenotype was dominant over the wrinkled. When you put round and wrinkle together in a wrestling match, round always won.
but wrinkled was still there. What was interesting about the F2 generation was that round and wrinkled were not present equally. Notice that I said 75% of the F2 generation was round and 25% was wrinkled. That means there was a 3 to 1 ratio of round to wrinkled. Mendel repeated his experiment with all of his other traits, seed color, pod shape, pod color, stem length, etc., and he got very similar results in all cases. In the first generation, one trait would be masked completely by another, and then upon self-fertilization, the masked trait would come back at about 25%. He was on to something really big. Now let me ask you, does it make sense to you that even though all of those F1 seeds were all round, that somehow in their DNA, in their genome, they still carry the wrinkle trait? Well, they must have, right? Because the wrinkle trait came back in the F2. And the only thing, the only parents of the F2 generation were individuals from F1. We didn't introduce any outside members to this cross. So how did the wrinkle trait get back to the F2 if it didn't come from the F1? So yes, it makes some sense that that trait has to be in there somewhere. And it also makes sense because we are products of our parents, Mommy and Daddy both contributed to F1. Daddy had round seeds. Mommy had wrinkled. But Mommy's DNA is in there somewhere. And Mendel was naive to something that we already know. There is something that we all have two of. Something that each of us has two of, and we got one from our mother and one from our father. Remember, Mendel didn't know what DNA was. No one in Mendel's time knew what DNA was. No one knew what chromosomes were, but we do. So that means the F1 plants got a single allele on a chromosome from one parent and got the other allele on another homologous chromosome from the other parent. One of those alleles was for round and the other was for wrinkled. And somehow the round allele was dominant over and masked the wrinkled trait, making all the F1 seeds round. But now that means the F1s are heterozygotic. Every single member of the F1 generation is heterozygotic because every single member is taking one round seed allele from one parent and has one wrinkled seed allele from the other parent. Every single member of the F1 generation is carrying one round allele and one wrinkled, making them heterozygotic. They all carry one of each allele. Before I go any further, I'm pretty sure most of you are confused and probably have no idea what I'm talking about. So let's back up. Stop talking about things in the abstract. Let's just get down to what really matters. Let's use a code, let's use some kind of, uh, you know, initials here, or some placeholders. Let's use the large capital letter R to represent round seeds, because they are, in fact, more important. They are the dominant ones. Round is dominant over wrinkled, so we can use lowercase r to represent wrinkled. Let's always stay to the same letter, so it's easy to keep track of the trait we're talking about. But the dominant trait is capital, and the, and the trait that's masked is lowercase. So this is a heterozygotic individual because they have one dominant allele and one non-dominant allele. They have one round seed allele and one wrinkled seed allele. But we already know that this individual with this genotype will have round seeds. One of our parents in our P generation was homozygotic, pure breeding, for round seeds. And so their genotype looked like this. They have round seeds. They have two round seed alleles. They're homozygotic. The other parent had wrinkled seeds. And so to have wrinkled seeds and be pure breeding, that individual had two wrinkled seed alleles. They were also homozygotic. The F1 progeny from this mating got one round allele from the father and one wrinkled allele from the mother, or vice versa. But they got one round allele from one parent and one wrinkled allele from the other parent. So every single individual in the F1 generation had this genotype. They were heterozygotic. One round allele, one wrinkled allele. 
But they all showed round seeds because round is dominant over wrinkled. Remember, everyone has two chromosomes. Every living diploid organism has two chromosomes, one from one parent and one from the other. For Mendel's observations to make sense, each parent, each plant parent, had to contribute equally to the genetic di- identity of their offspring. Now, you and I look at each other and we say, sure, of course, what's the big deal? But back in Mendel's day, that itself was a huge breakthrough. So many people thought that, well, if the son looks more like the father, it's because the father gave more of the information to the son. If the child looked more like the mother, it's because the child got more of that information from the mother. That, that's not true. Each parent contributes equally to the genetic identity of the offspring. And so, for all offspring, and therefore all sexually reproducing life, because we're all someone else's offspring, contain two genetic elements for every single trait one from each parent on the chromosome we got from that parent. We can think of these elements as chromosomes, which are just chains of alleles, as individual alleles if we're considering a single trait, but we're getting one from each parent giving us two. So with all that in mind, let's go back to what Mendel did again and let's do it a little bit more simply. Mendel takes his homozygotic round-seeded plants, big R, big R, and mates them with his homozygotic wrinkle-seeded plants, little r, little r. The only allele that the round-seeded plants could contribute to offspring is a large round-seed allele, because that's all that parent has to offer. The only allele that the wrinkled-seeded plant can give to the next round of offspring is a wrinkled allele, because that's all that parent has to offer. These were, in fact, pure breeding homozygotic strains. These gametes come together and give rise to every single individual in the F1 generation being heterozygotic. One round seed allele from one parent, one wrinkled seed allele from the other parent, and every single one of those plants has round seeds because round is dominant over wrinkled. But now let's go to the F2. Here something very interesting happens. For the F2 generation, this individual can make two different types of gametes. This individual can give the round allele to the next generation. Remember, independent assortment, segregation during meiosis, these alleles, these chromosomes separate. So this parent can give the round allele to the next generation, or this parent can give the wrinkled allele to the next generation. These parents up here didn't have that option. It was round or round, same thing. Wrinkled or wrinkled, same thing. But this parent has a choice. There's a 50-50 chance of this parent contributing a gamete to the next generation that has a big R allele for round or a little r allele for wrinkled. And so we can represent all of the different types of matings of the F1 like this. This is called a Punnett square. We're taking the two different gamete types of one parent, daddy, let's say, and putting them across the top. Dad can either give a big R for round or a little r for wrinkled. And then, remember, all the F1s are the same, so mommy comes from F1 too. Mommy's gametes are put along the side. R, big R for round, little r for wrinkled. And then we go through the square, and we bring all the big R's across... or the little r's across. That's what that parent contributed to the mating. And we bring everything down. And we fill in the square. This is the predicted result of the F1 cross, given the gametes and alleles that these F1s can contribute to their next generation, the F2. And look what we see. Of these offspring, what percentage of them, what fraction of them would have round seeds? Well, there's four possible outcomes. One, two, three, four. And three of those four possible outcomes will have round seeds. Remember, your round seeds if you have just one dominant round seed allele. 
So these offspring have round seeds, these offspring have round seeds, and these offspring have round seeds. So three-fourths, or 75%, of these offspring will have round seeds. What percentage of the total will have wrinkled seeds? Well, you only get wrinkled seeds here. That's one-fourth. That's one-quarter of the total possible outcomes, or 25%. That's exactly what Mendel saw. So by just looking at and predicting the types of gametes each parent could make, and then filling in this Punnett square, we can predict or explain the offspring in the F2 generation. This is the crux of all of Mendelian genetics. What I have just explained will allow you to understand the next four lectures, and in its most basic sense, make up all of the underpinning concepts of exam one. So if you're not understanding this right now, I recommend that you pause the lecture and back up, maybe take another look at it. If you don't think that's going to help or you've tried that already and it hasn't helped, you must come to office hours. Uh, you must seek my help. If you get lost now, you will have a very hard time recovering because everything we're going to do from this point on simply builds on this one concept we've just covered. So be sure you're okay with this. All right, so we can kind of think about these single gene crosses that we've just looked at and, and tie them into, have them make sense with meiosis. Mendel's results suggest something else. Mendel's results suggest that even though each parent contains two chromosomes themselves, they only pass one of those chromosomes onto an offspring. And again, when we say genetic elements, we can also substitute the word allele. Even though each parent possesses two alleles for every trait, they only pass one allele onto an offspring. For Mendel, that was a uh, landmark finding, a landmark supposition. For us, it's somewhat commonplace now. That means to us that gametes must contain what the parent is contributing to the next generation. So the parents must contain one and only one of the two genetic elements that the parent has to offer. That means the chance of a parent passing one element or the other, one chromosome or the other, one allele or the other, the chances of the parents contributing those must be equal, 50-50. I'll put this in some context with the plant seeds again. Uh, if we have a heterozygotic plant with round seeds, meaning the seeds are round, but the genotype is one round allele and one wrinkled allele, there's no way the plant can choose to prefer to give the round allele over the wrinkled. There's no way the plant can give the round allele with a higher frequency of the wrinkled. Every single offspring plant, every single gamete made, has a 50-50 shot of getting the round allele or the wrinkled. Has to be even. Has to be 50-50. That means during fertilization, the two single elements, chromosomes or alleles from each parent, come together and fuse, making a new diploid organism that contains two genetic elements, as all organisms do, one contributed from the mother and one contributed from the father. This is a brief and general synopsis of what we just described for monohybrid crosses. This is also a brief and general synopsis of what we, occur what we discussed in the last lecture for meiosis. So the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis for gamete production tie in directly to and play a role in what Mendel saw as his genetic traits being passed on from generation to generation. What's new to us now in this lecture that wasn't in the meiosis lecture is that only one allele is being expressed as a phenotype. We never talked about the expression of the genes in meiosis, just that parents gave one allele and one chromosome to each gamete, and gametes fused to give the offspring two chromosomes or alleles. What happened from that point on, we didn't know at the end of the last lecture. Now we know that there's dominance. And oftentimes, one of those alleles will mask and overtake the other. Round is dominant over wrinkled. So mom gave wrinkled. Great. Wrinkled is in the genome. Wonderful. The organism is heterozygotic. Awesome. But the expression of the trait is round due to the round allele exclusively. Round is dominant, and wrinkled is recessive. The term we use for the masked traits, the masked alleles, is recessive. What these words here describe are the principle of segregation, 
That is that two alleles, two chromosomes, separate when gametes form. They separate when? In anaphase. And they do so equally with a 50-50 pro uh, probability. And the concept of dominance. That when you have two alleles of two different types, one is dominant over the other. And the dominant allele is the expressed trait. We can actually tie Mendel's observations to specific stages of meiosis. Remember meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. Separation of chromosomes, separation of chromatids. Awesome, awesome stuff. Mendel's first observation that each individual organism possesses two genetic elements, two chromosomes, two alleles, to encode a trait. Well, that doesn't even play into meiosis. That's the case of all living cells. All of our cells have two of every chromosome. That's how we're built. Mendel saw that alleles, these genetic traits, they separate when gametes are formed. And so gametes can only contain one version of the trait or the other. Parents can only give one of the two genetic elements that they possess. That separation occurs in anaphase, anaphase 1 of meiosis, when the chromosomes themselves are separated. That's the reductive division. And then related, Mendel's third observation, that alleles separate in equal proportions with a 50-50 shot, well, that's also anaphase 1. We know the, the molecular basis for that. The reason why it's 50-50 is because there's only two chromosomes. And they're physically continuous. So you can't give more of one chromosome to one gamete than the other. There are only two chromosomes. And in anaphase 2, those two chromosomes are pulled to opposite sides of the cell. And then in telophase, those cells separate. And so it's 50-50 because you have two chromosomes. One goes to one cell, one goes to the other. There's your 50-50 split. Mendel's other principle, the principle of independent assortment, you might not remember this, but it is important. We covered it in the last lecture. That is that the distribution of chromosomes don't tie into each other at all. Uh, the idea that I can make a gamete that has my father's chromosome number one, my father's chromosome number two, my father's chromosome number three, my mother's chromosome number four, my mother's chromosome number five. But I can also make a gamete that has my mother's chromosome number one, my father's chromosome number two, my mother's chromosome number three, my father's chromosome number four, etc. That's the idea of independent assortment. We can mix and match each member of homologous pairs as we make gametes randomly. As long as each gamete contains one and only one member of each homologous pair. Not to get too bogged down in the details of meiosis, uh, we don't want to lose sight of the big picture either, but again, I think it's important that we tie concepts together, and the things that Mendel observed with his pea plants in the 1800s are directly related to the behavior of chromosomes during meiosis. Mendel didn't know about DNA, but you do. Everything Mendel saw is based in the foundations of meiosis, so it's important to make those connections, I think. So now that we understand how single gene traits are transmitted from one generation to another, we can actually predict the outcomes of some genetic crosses. Knowing all that we now know, we can predict the results of a typical monohybrid cross without looking at the progeny at all. And we can back-figure, we can reverse-engineer, figure out parental genotypes in some cases by looking only at the offspring. Again, for monohybrid crosses and monohybrid crosses only, we can best understand things and keep it organized in our minds using Punnett squares. I will not allow you to use Punnett squares beyond monohybrid crosses. I'll tell you how you'll do higher level crosses in the next lecture, but Punnett squares are fine for single gene crosses. Here's a cross. A heterozygotic tall plant. Well, that just gave us a hell of a lot of information. I now know the genotype. The genotype is one dominant allele and one recessive allele, because I said the word heterozygotic. I know the phenotype, tall, because I said a heterozygotic tall plant, and I even know the dominance and recessivity patterns. I know that tall is dominant to short, and I know that because the heterozygotic plant, which is one tall allele and one short allele, shows the tall trait. There's a lot there. I make that with a short plant. Well, think about it. The only way you can be a short plant is if you have two recessive alleles. If you have any other allele in there, it's going to be a tall allele. And once you put a tall allele in that genotype, that plant's going to be tall. So the only way you can be short as a pea plant is to have two recessive alleles. So the short plant is homozygotic. We're going to do this cross. 
So we're going to make our Punnett square. We're going to put one parent's genotypes across the gametes across the top, the other parent's gametes along the side. So we'll set it up this way in this case. We have the short plant along the top and their heterozygotic tall plant across the side. The short plant can only give a short allele, but it has two of them to give, so we have to represent each one. The tall plant can give 50% of the time the tall allele, the other 50% of the time contribute only the short allele. And we fill this in. We drag the alleles across and we drag the alleles down. And by doing so, we can determine the result of every possible combination. Well, if we have this tall allele carried across and this short allele carried across, we're going to get ourselves another tall heterozygotic plant. And the same is true here. The same tall allele is contributed by this plant. Here we get the second short allele, but it doesn't really matter. The outcome is the same. If we have this mating result, the heterozygotic plant gives its short allele. The short plant gives one of its short alleles. We have a homozygotic short plant. That's going to be a plant that's short. And the same is true here. The same short allele from one plant, the other short allele from the other plant, giving us homozygotic short. We can then note the phenotype of each possible progeny. If we're heterozygotic, we're going to be tall. If we're homozygotic short, we're going to be short. And we can calculate the ratios for the phenotypes. These ratios are easy. This is a one-to-one -one ratio. Half of the offspring will be tall, and half of the offspring will be short. If you said it's a two-to-two -two ratio, that's fine, too. I don't really care about the nuts and bolts of it. The fact of the matter is it's 50% tall and 50% short. Now, what's this idea about figuring out parental genotypes? What do we mean by that? Well, imagine that I just told you that I had a tall plant and I mated it with a short plant. And I didn't give you any information about the genotypes of those parents at all. A tall plant mated with a short plant. Well, if you were clever and you were astute, you would say, well, I, I know the genotype of the short plant. You're not tricking me, you bastard. The short plant is homozygotic recessive, because that's the only way you can be short. Any other genotype would result in a tall plant. So I'm certain that the, that the genotype of the short plant is little t, little t. It's the tall plant that I'm curious about. You see, the tall plant could be homozygotic dominant, or it could be heterozygotic. So I don't know what the genotype is about the, the tall plant yet. And then I continue the question to you. I say, well, I took my tall plant and my short plant and I mated them. And of that mating, 50% 50% percent of the offspring were tall and 50% of the offspring were short. You should reply with, aha, I now know the genotype of the tall plant. There were only two possible genotypes for the tall plant. Homozygotic dominant, meaning big T, big T, or heterozygotic, big T, little t. Both of those plants would be tall. However, if the genotype of the tall plant was big T, big T, that tall plant would have contributed nothing but dominant alleles to all of its offspring. And so all of the offspring would have had dominant T alleles, and all of the offspring, as a result, would have been tall. But I told you that 50% of the offspring of this mating were short. That means 50% of the children had to get a short allele from the tall parent, making the tall parent heterozygotic. So once we see the expression of the recessive trait in the offspring, there had to be a recessive allele in both parents. That means this parent had to contain the recessive allele, making him heterozygotic. This is called a back cross, when you, or a test cross. When you take an unknown genotype of a dominant parent and mate it with a recessive individual, you are testing or backing the cross in order to see the, the genotype of that parent. So here's a real-world example. The ability to curl your tongue, to make your tongue a tube, is kind of, there's some debate about this, but for our intents and purposes, it's a genetic trait determined by a single gene. Single gene trait, just like pea seed color and pea seed shape and pea plant height, etc. And curling the tongue, being able to curl that tongue, is the dominant trait. It's dominant over being able not to. So you need only one curling allele to be able to curl your tongue. 
and here is my ridiculous family photo, just for you. This is myself, of course, my wife, and my two beautiful daughters, Charlotte and Maddie. I hope it's obvious in the picture, but I am horrible at curling my tongue. I can't do it, much to my girls' amusement. Um, pretty much on a nightly basis, they will curl their tongues into perfect tubes and then request that I curl mine, which I can't do, and they giggle and they laugh and they laugh and they giggle. My wife can curl her tongue as well, and my daughters obviously can. What's my genotype? Well, let's say we're going to use the letter C to represent the ability to curl your tongue. You should know that my genotype is little c, little c. Because being able to curl is the dominant trait, and I can't do it. So if I had any dominant alleles, I'd be curling my tongue. And I don't have any dominant alleles, making me homozygotic recessive. So I'm little c, little c. Can you tell me what my wife's genotype is, given the provided information? Hopefully you said no, you can't. You can narrow it down. She's either homozygotic dominant or heterozygotic. She certainly has a dominant allele because she can curl her tongue. But we don't know which. Now some of you might be saying right now, well, I know she's homozygotic dominant because both your kids can do it. But that becomes a statistical argument. That's not a large sample size. I will agree with you. If I had 1,000 kids and all of them could curl their tongue, statistically I would believe that my wife was homozygotic dominant and could give nothing but dominant alleles. But I only have two kids. And so that's not a large enough sample size. So no, we can't be certain what my wife's genotype is, given the provided information. What about my kid's genotype, though? Can you be certain about those? Well, hopefully you can be. They definitely have one dominant allele. Of that you can be sure, because they can each curl their tongue. But they can't be homozygotic dominant, can they? Why can't they be homozygotic dominant? I'm their father, and I had nothing but recessive alleles to give. See my horrible, sad attempt at curling my tongue? I am homozygotic recessive. So I gave each of these girls a recessive allele. But they got a dominant allele from their mother because they can curl their tongue. So each of these girls is heterozygotic. We can be certain of that because of who their parents are. So it all comes down to understanding the trait that the individual expresses. Is it the dominant trait or the recessive trait? Understanding the alleles that the parent must have with those traits and how those alleles can be distributed through sexual reproduction. Now I ask you this. Given the mating that's here in this Punnett square, we predict a 50-50 split. 50-50, okay? one-to-one proportion of tall plants to short plants in the offspring. Is that how it would really turn out? If you made four baby plants, do you really think two of them would be tall and two of them would be short? Maybe but not necessarily. Try it. These probabilities of yes, no, A, B, heads, tails, these two outcome probabilities, these are coin flips. So get a coin, flip it four times. Statistically, you should get two heads and two tails, but you might not. If you don't, it doesn't fly in the face of statistics, probability, mathematics. It is still chance. If you flipped a coin 400 times, you should statistically get damn close to 200 and 200. Now, you might get 201 and 199. You might get 204 and 196. But you'd be really, really close with 400 coin flips. But you flip a coin four times, you could get three tails and one head. That doesn't invalidate the probability. It comes back to sample size. When we talk about probability, we're talking about sample size, statistics. Just because both my daughters can curl their tongue doesn't mean my wife is homozygotic dominant. It's not a large enough sample size. It's all in that N. It's all in the sample size. And Mendel could make his inferences because the pea plants have so many offspring. So we're going to have to get into some of that stats. We're going to have to get into some of that prob probability. We're going to have to understand the simple math behind the Mendelian genetics in order to master these higher level of crosses, but we'll save all that for the next lecture.
So what did we talk about today? Well, we started off talking about Mendel. Mendel conducted his experiments on the breeding behavior of pea plants. He chose seven different characteristics of pea plants to look at, and lucky for Mendel, all of them were two trait traits, two different possibilities in those traits, and no more than two. Anytime an organism has two different alleles for a single gene, they are heterozygotic at that gene. If they have two identical alleles, they are homozygotic. We talked a little bit about the nature versus nurture uh, debate. Certainly for almost all traits we possess, there is some genetic component, but it's fair to say for almost all traits, there's some environmental component as well. It's extremely rare for a trait, especially in us, to be exclusively genetically based or exclusively environmental. Mendel was lucky in that he dealt with nothing but purely genetic traits, and he worked very hard to keep the environment of his plants nearly identical. Mendel started his experiments with pure breeding strains of pea plants. These are plants that were genetically pure. They were homozygotic at all traits. They were um, clones, genetic clones of one another. And he did his crosses. The cross that we spent the most time on was round seeds by wrinkled seeds. The first generation of the cross, the parental generation, who the parents were, is called the P generation. The F1 are the childrens of that cross, childrens are the offspring of that cross. When Mendel looked at the F1 seeds, he saw that they were all round. Round was dominant over wrinkled. He took those round seeded plants of the F1, he self-mated them, he got an F2, this is the grandchildren of the parental generation, and he saw the wrinkled trait comes back. In the F2, he had a 3 to 1 ratio of round seeds to wrinkled. The wrinkled phenotype came back because it had been there in the F1, but it was masked. It was dominant over. There's a tutorial on this in Canvas. So round was dominant over wrinkled. Wrinkled was recessive. Because of that, and every single plant in the F1 was heterozygotic, the F1 seeds were round. What happened in the F2 was that we had some reemergence of the wrinkled phenotype because in the F2 heterozygotics were being mated and there was a 1 in 4 chance of the two recessive alleles coming together in that cross a 25 percent chance of a, a homozygotic recessive individual being born. Parents possess two genetic elements you can think of these as two chromosomes or two alleles for every single genetic trait but even though parents possess two they only pass one on to an offspring this is because of segregation during anaphase one of meiosis and using Punnett squares we can predict the results of crosses we can predict the offspring if we know the genotypes of the parents we can often sometimes infer the genotypes of the parents by looking at the offspring and we did some of those exercises to stop we're going to talk a little bit more about the basic principles of heredity in the next lecture. We're going to move on to dihybrid crosses. That's crosses where we consider two different traits simultaneously. That's the rest of Chapter 3, and I look forward to it, as I'm sure you do. Thanks for watching. See you soon.